Welcome back to the Cross Border Interview Podcast. My guest today is Calgary City Council candidate for Ward 4, DJ Kelly. DJ, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you for the invitation, Chris. Um, DJ, I start off all my interviews the same way. You're no exception. What's, where did your sense of duty to serve come from? Uh, it's it's an interesting question because, like, as I sort of I think back on that, I, I kind of always been this way, I guess. And and I've I've always worked in uh, mostly worked in not for profit and, and and the public sector. So from that point of view, that like that's definitely been where my my heart and interest has laid. Um, whether that be I. I grew up in sort of the arts community, working for the not-for-profit arts community here in Calgary, and then uh, in eventually into the city of Calgary, and then United Way, and now with the University of Calgary. So they all kind of have that that sense of duty, sort of thematically throughout them, uh, to be able to, you know, how do you, how do you make the lives of other people better? Um, and and my role has always been within community engagement. So um, originally marketing, and then into community engagement, which is about how can you actually like in my current role at the university, how do you partner with other not-for-profit organizations in the city in order to help both organizations achieve their objectives together? But where does it come from? Uh, I, I was a Boy Scout. I, I don't know if that definitely uh, uh, means means a huge amount, but uh, I, I remember even being back then, uh, you know, wanting to uh, wanting to make things better for the troop, and as a cub, wanting to be a cub leader, and you know, those kinds of things. I do remember my parents saying when I was a kid, though, they're like, you're going to be the prime minister someday. And I think that was just because I really like to argue or I would call it debate. They probably would call it arguing. Um, so I want to talk about went that. Away. I, I want to talk a little bit about that. I apologize for interrupting there, but I want to ask you, were, did you come from a political family? Uh, where did you get your political intuition and your political uh, sort of desire? Is Was it from your family or are you sort of the oddball in the family and putting your name forward for political office is a new thing for your family? Yeah, it's not in my family at all that I'm, you know, that I'm aware of. I should guess I shouldn't say that. If you go back, I know that in Southern Ontario, my grandfather was the reeve of a very small town, which maybe says more that he drew the short straw than, than anything else. But no, it's it's not part of uh, not part of sort of my upbringing, if you will. But I always knew it was a possibility. But it, it's never really been a huge interest for me. Uh, a few years back, I actually, this is a little bit nerdy, but a few years back, I actually did a bit of a Venn diagram of like, what, what are all the areas of interest that I have and what do they have in common? And that was things like, I mentioned community engagement, but it's also uh, project management. I'm a certified project manager, uh, politics, governance. Uh, I'm a huge, you know, Robert's Rules governance type nerd. Um, what do all these things kind of have in common? And, and, and uh, well, I guess strategy development, organizational development, I should include those two, uh, cultural transformation of organizations, marketing, what do they all have in common? The short answer to it was, um, I'm really fascinated by how groups of people come together to make decisions. And so that's kind of what I would say that um, my background uh, has been, uh, you know, sort of a career trajectory is about how do I make it easier for people to make decisions that make it uh, um, uh, make the world a better place? Now, uh, to, to really get into the nitty gritty part of this, the policy stuff of this, I first got to ask the question, why 2021? What made you decide in 2021, I was going to run for city council for Ward 4? <clears throat> um. So I guess the first thing I should say to that is I, I wasn't originally, I, mean, I thought about running for council like 10 plus years ago and, and never ended up doing it. Uh, I was the president of my community association, Winston Heights Mountain View Community Association for six years on the board for I think 11 or 12 years in, in total before I stepped off this past year. I still serve on the finance committee and the development permit review committee, but uh, you know, new blood kind of thing. Um, I, I guess I'll put it this way is that uh, I, I don't know if it was the new year or it was COVID or, or uh, vaccines starting to roll out early on in the spring, but I started getting a lot of phone calls and emails from neighbors uh, saying, hey, like, 
where aren't we just, we're looking into the, the uh, 2021 and there's an election happening this year. We just, we didn't, you know, we're just starting to think about this. And they realized that in that particular case, uh, our neighborhood uh, uh, is actually moving to Ward 4. We're currently in Ward 7, but as of election day, we'll be in Ward 4. <clears throat> and so a lot of these folks who were, who were taking a look at that and looking forward to what's happening in the year realized, hey, we're moving to Ward 4. And that means Sean Chu would, would potentially be our counselor. And uh, he's not terribly popular. There's a, there's a lot of people, I, I mean, lots of people like Sean, but there's a lot of people who don't like Sean and 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 his politics and sort of what he what how he advocates for things, um, and so from that point of view, I was starting a lot of phone calls saying, "Hey, like, who should we vote for? Like, like who's running?" Because I used to work in the city, I'm into politics, all that sort of stuff. Kind of had that a bit of that, you know, known for having my ear to the ear to the ground kind of thing, and uh, started making a couple phone calls to say hey, like who's running who's really thinking about this like how can i support you how can i help you and the short answer was there wasn't really anyone with the skill set that we're going to need uh, as we move forward who was contemplating uh putting their name forward and so as a result uh at some point you uh you have to look in the mirror and uh, i think i had a few people saying that but like well if there's nobody you know that means it has to be you um, and uh, after a while, they kind of wore me down and they were like, here, here, you know, I'll give you a hundred dollars. I'll give you $50. I'll, I'll volunteer. I'll manage your signs, whatever. And so sort of a community kind of started to coalesce or, around that idea. And uh, eventually they, uh, they wore me down and I was like, yeah, you know what? I, I have a lot of ideas for what we could do in terms of the city and how we could make it a better place how we can make our neighborhoods better, what we could do to uh, uh, to increase diversity and inclusion and how we can make the place just in general a, a better, more livable city to live in. So yeah, let's let's do it. I I was probably the last one to come on board, um, but uh, I'm here now and I'm, I'm, I'm ready to uh, uh, commit to this and let's do this. Let's uh, let's have some fun with, uh, with the process and hopefully uh, we have a good outcome on October 18th and we can start to the real hard work of, of making some, um, some changes that'll really help people in this time and place. Oh, we'll talk about the real hard choices that you have in a few minutes, but I, I want to talk about a, a statement that you just made because you're the first candidate I've talked to who says, who's had their ear to the ground. I find that a fascinating uh, statement because most politicians uh, will go into elected politics or try to get into politics because they have issues that they want to address. But you're saying, hey, I've got the ear to the ground. I'm hearing what the residents are needing and wanting, especially in your uh, area. I got to ask the question to follow up with that is what are you hearing? What are the issues facing Ward 4 residents today and for the future of Ward 4? Yeah, the first thing is probably sort of important to note on that is that Ward 4 is a pretty diverse series of neighborhoods. It's not, uh, so it's really hard to say one thing. It ties the entire community, uh, uh, all the communities together. But I, I will say the one thing that I do think that is sort of uh, uh, thematic, and I, it's probably not unique to just Ward 4, is that there is a real sense of trepidation right now. Um, maybe you can call it worry, worry or, or, or however you want to refer to it. But in short, Calgary, like Calgary's in a tough spot currently, whether you, uh, how are we going to come out of the pandemic? The pandemic simply exacerbated the problem that we had in terms of the economic downturn to begin with in Calgary. There's a lot of sort of uh, um, uh, challenges that Calgary is facing right now. And it's going to take a certain skill set in order to be able to uh, get us out of that situation. So um, everybody kind of has their own sort of take on that, right? Whether it be, uh, I find that the city's uh, not affordable or enough. I find it's hard to, hard to get a job. Our, our youth are leaving. Um, I, I, oil and gas is, has, is, is not bouncing back the way that I hoped it would. Um, even just honestly, COVID and some of the office workers returning to the office and the trepidation that that brings in in terms of what's it going to be like and is it going to be safe and uh, will I have to wear a mask or even the trepidation that comes along with hybrid work, right? So some days I'll work from home and some days I'll be in an office. 
there's an awful lot of sort of uh, uh, worrying, I guess, that's that's going on. Um, and so as a result of that, as a result of that sort of worrying, I'd say that's kind of thematically what we're, what we're sort of seeing. But if you want to get into specific neighborhoods, there, there's lots of different things. Development is always one. Uh, transportation is a huge one uh, um, throughout the city. We're pretty lucky in terms of uh, Ward 4 that we have a pretty active transportation network, um, but there's still a lot of opportunity to, uh, to be able to um, provide additional transportation choice uh, beyond just the green line but um, we can talk about the green line if you want if you want to because uh, it's uh, it was just approved a little while ago but it's still gonna stop at 16th Avenue in the north yeah um, I, I love candidates who make my job a lot easier than it should be you have just set up about 15 follow-up questions that usually I have to pull out so I appreciate you doing that. <laughs> I, my I, pleasure, I, I guess. I, I want to dive into some of those issues that you were talking about, uh, especially about affordable housing, youth leaving, oil and gas, and that hesitancy to go back to work. And then we'll talk about transportation as well. On your website, which is djkelly.ca, for my listeners and to my viewers, the link to DJ's website will be in the show notes along with the social media. So if you want to learn more after the interview, please go and check it out. You, 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 you talk about three main areas and a little bit more in depth here, which is getting Calgarians back to work, being smarter with our money and a city we can be, we are proud of. How do those three points line up with what you're hearing at the door to start with? Yeah. So I, from what I was just saying there, I think you can, the getting Calgary Calgarians back to work, that one's pretty straightforward, uh, yeah. but I will, I will, I will expand upon that uh, a bit here. Um, there's a lot of, as we were talking about, there's a lot of issues facing Calgary right now. Some of them we can call out specifically, whether it be poverty, uh, mental health issues. Uh, um, the pandemic has definitely exacerbated that problem, which has brought along a lot of uh, additional social issues such as um, um, uh, domestic violence. Um, there's a lot of things in there that are increased by the fact that we don't have our, by our economy and the issues that we're having there in terms of the downturn in the economy. Uh, the number one priority in order to be able to, to in order to be able to bring down uh, um, our poverty levels in order to be able to address a lot of those social issues um, is really going to be around getting more people solid, stable employment. And in order to be able to do that, we know that we know that uh, um, oil and gas is not going to bounce back the way that we wish it would. It'll bounce back, yes, but not to the not to the degree that we wish it would. So from that point of view, the, the, the number one priority for us definitely has to be around economic diversification. Um, and that means we have to look to some new industries, which means we need to we need to be innovative. We need to be we need to be uh, uh, taking a look at what are the other things that are working well in Calgary? What are we a hub for in Calgary that maybe isn't as well known as the energy sector? And how can we actually uh, uh, do more of that? And some of those things are around the tech sector, uh, uh, aerospace, logistics. Those are all sectors that we know that uh, Calgary uh, has a toehold in already. So how can we actually uh, move the needle on those a little bit more in order to be able to have more jobs available in Calgary in order to repopulate the downtown a little bit more, in order to be able to create some uh, um, more stable employment and, and thus reducing uh, some of those poverty and affordability uh, related issues. I also, in terms of that one, lump the green line into there too, because that is going to be the biggest, um, uh, the, the biggest construction project that the city has ever, uh, or at least municipal construction project that the city has ever seen. That's another great way to be able to get people back to work. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to us, you know, getting the shovels in the dirt ASAP on that. I, I, I'm going to challenge you a little bit here because I, I yet again, I'm just, I'm just doing my job here. Um, Calgary is not in a unique position. This is happening across Canada, around the world. Jobs are leaving. Jobs are becoming. We are. We have learned in the last eighteen months that uh, the traditional nine to five job does not need to be happened because we can have conversations like this. People have been doing yeah. work from home. Um, 
But attracting jobs is going to be a challenge because yet again, every municipality, every big uh, city is going to be doing the exact same thing. How do you envision changing the atmosphere at City Hall and changing the atmosphere in uh, Calgary to start attracting that diverse business sector that you want? Because every municipality is going to be doing the exact same thing. So how do we do it better than say Edmonton? And I'm just picking on Edmonton, nothing against Edmonton to my listeners and my viewers, but I'm just picking on Edmonton right now. Yeah, I would say that uh, um, the third point in that, uh, in that platform of being a city we're proud of kind of gets to a lot of the, a lot of those points, which is like, I've had a lot of conversations with, with youth who are leaving, who are leaving Calgary. And when you ask them what, like, why are you leaving? A lot of it has to do with exactly what you're talking about there, Chris, that um, a workforce can be much more mobile now than it ever has been before. And we've really proven that in the past sort of 18 months that you can, a lot of workers can work from almost anywhere. <clears throat> um, Calgary has a very unique uh, a, a business case, if you will. We are so close to the mountains. We are a beautiful city with a lovely river, uh, Nose Hill Park, Fish Creek Park. If you love the outdoors, Calgary is the perfect place for you. There are very few cities in Canada, uh, especially in sort of that million plus mark that, that have the amenities that Calgary has, uh, Calgary has available to us. So from that point of view, we really do already have a leg up on a, on a lot of communities in, in Canada. So what's really missing is, uh, and, and actually I'll pause there for a second and say that that what used to be known as the Alberta advantage, right? That we had, yep. not only did we have all of those things, but we also had all these good, strong uh, paying jobs. Alberta was the place that you could, that you would go to and Calgary being the heart, uh, heart of it with, uh, with the, uh, um, with the, I'll, I'll call it capital. Edmonton has the capital, but Calgary has the capital. Yeah. Makes sense. <laughs> um, Dra Dragonfly Empire uh, um, uh, lyric. Anyway, um, so from that point of view, we do really do have a good strong uh, uh, leg up on a lot of other cities. Uh, and so what's really missing at this point is simply, I say simply the economic diversification as if that's a simple thing to solve. But that is something that is a lot easier to solve than some of the challenges that a lot of other big cities in North America have. Uh, the other big issue around economic recovery and getting people back to work is making sure while we w worry about people who are trying to get back to work, we have to worry about everyone. We have to worry about the people who are living paycheck to paycheck because the next mm -hmm. round of budgeting consultations is going to be hard. The last 18 months have destroyed the city's finances and the economic downturn with oil and gas has put another hit into the finances as well. How do you envision working with your fellow councillors and advocating for, for all residents, even the ones who are struggling day to day and potentially are losing their houses right now to ensure that everyone gets a fair shot at recovery? Yeah, so this is probably the most key sort of question that we can sort of be asking ourselves right now, because I don't want to sugarcoat this. This is not going to be an easy challenge to overcome. Um, and to that end, I'd say that where it really starts is, as you're saying there, that the, the 14 councillors and the mayor and how they work together. Um, it, a couple of the skill sets that, you're gonna, that we're going to really need to see around that table this year is uh, number one, innovation. We, the way that we've been doing things is not gonna necessarily be the way that's gonna get us out of these challenges. So as a result, I would say, whether it's me or someone else, please pick people who you wanna put in the council chamber, who you believe have new ideas, good ideas, are willing to challenge things, are willing to try things a little bit differently in order to be able to take that little bit of risk in order to be able to uh, um, open things up and create some new opportunities. The second skill set that I would say that we really need to have around that table is the ability to collaborate. This is going to take a lot of conversations about what is the right way, a lot of debate. Um, there's not a simple, straightforward answer to this. So as a result, we're going to need to try a few different things. And the best way for us to be able to do that is by having uh, individuals around that table who are able to work with each other, able to have conversations, able to challenge each other re respectfully in order to be able to uh, move the needle forward. 
To your second point uh, uh, about how do we make sure that we bring everyone along, that needs to be, that, that's in and of itself is not a job by itself. That is something that needs to be built into literally every single thing that the city does. Diversity, inclusion, affordability, all of these kinds of things need to be included when we're, when we're taking a look at every single one of the services that the city of Calgary is offering. I would also add to that as well, um, the very real threat, threat of, of climate change. So building a sustainable city as well, uh, in my mind would fall into that bucket as well. So that we can actually, when we build the things that we build or do the things that we do, we're doing them in the most efficient and effective way possible so that we can make sure that we're getting as much return for investment on our limited tax, dollar, tax dollars as we can. One of the areas on your website, yet again, djkelly.ca, is accountability. And this is under the a city we are proud of. Um, there is a major accountability and transparency issue with this current council. Uh, you speak to residents across the city and you hear time and time again, uh, it feels like an island upon itself. City, the councillors leave, they go to city hall and nothing is really held accountable because there's a lot of secrecy, there's a lot of backroom deals. How do you envision being more accountable and more transparent with the people of Ward 4 if elected on October 18th? Because that is going to be one thing that all 15 new councillors, if everyone gets uh, defeated and there's no incumbents returning, will have to face. Yeah, I, I'm glad you bring up transparency because uh, the, the cousin of accountability is transparency. You can't make, you can't have people be accountable without also having the transparency. And the way that I normally draw that is transparency increases accountability a little bit, which increases transparency a little bit and up they go up the ladder kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, I, I would say it starts with, uh, um, quite frankly, council needs to be a lot more clear about what their objectives are. We talk a lot, the city's uh, motto is a great place to make a living and make a life, but we need a real solid definition of what that means so that we can actually line up those limited tax dollars to achieve each one of those objectives. Um, I used to be at the city of Calgary uh, several years ago now, and uh, one of the projects that I worked on there at the time was uh, something called the Corporate Cultural Transformation Project. I can get into the details about what that if you want, but uh, suffice to say what it was, was that the project was who are we when, we being the city staff, who are we when we're at our best? And then how can we line up, what are the things that are in, uh, what are the barriers, the things that are in the way of us doing that? all the time. And what we learned from that project was really quite clear, which was uh, city staff are at their best when they have a clear outcome and they work together. And what's standing in the way of them uh, having a clear outcome and working together, quite frankly, is council. <laughs> it's the strategy. I, I'm count, uh, Council does a really good job working with administration every year of setting up a work plan. They know what they're going to do. But for an organization that's a, what, $4 billion organization, it doesn't have a strategy. Um, and that to me is kind of mind boggling that we don't know why we're doing each one of these things. So from that point of view, I, I think that every citizen in Calgary should be able to know why, why are you picking up my recycling every second week? Or why, why is my, the playground in my neighborhood only get fixed once every, 25 years, I think it is. Um, the issue around that, though, to... is, sorry, the issue around that is miscommunication, because you can be as transparent as you want, you can be as accountable as you want, but miscommunication or misinformation and Twitter and social media is the crux of any transparency, because you can be as transparent as you want. People can take things that you say completely out of context or out of, and I'm going to say this because of the whole around anti-maskers and anti-vaxxers right now, around science. So how do you battle that in a trans, uh, wanting to be as transparent as possible? Yeah. And this is for me where it, it, it flips from the why to the how. So really clearly articulating, this is where we get into the total like nerdy part of this that you and I will love this in the podcast, yeah. but it's <laughs> right. It's really hard to put this in a brochure that you're going to like knock on a door and hand off them. Um, but yeah, it, it really comes down to the how. And that, and that is 
the objectives themselves. What are the measures of success that the city of Calgary is using? How do we actually know that we're making movement against these things? So this is why we're doing it. Here's how we're going to measure that we're going against it. Those things become a lot more sort of uh, um, black and white. You know, are we turning the curve? Are we moving towards our eventual goal? Are we getting good return on investment for, uh, for how much this is costing us to be able to do this? Um, this is, I would, I would argue, is not just simply a, a, a send more tweets kind of thing. This is about changing the dialogue with citizens. So we're not just um, complaining about things. We're actually, council is actually articulating every single time they, they, they pass something or every single time they approve something, what benefit is it giving? Where are we moving? Why are we moving there? How much, is, uh, what kind of benefit are we getting for this particular activity? And then that way the conversation can be twofold. One, do we agree that's something that we want? And two, do we agree that's the best way to achieve that if it is? Um, whereas right now I would argue we're just kind of, everybody is just arguing about the ifs and ands and the who's and buts and all that messy stuff at the bottom that really takes away our time and energy from having the real conversations that matter at the top. Uh, you've mentioned it a few times and I want to ask this question because I feel like it's an important one. You are in a unique position because you have worked for the city of Calgary, you have been administration. And as someone who, uh, first from someone who has worked in municipal administration as well, I, you know the, you know the skeletons, you know the, the, where, where there's uh, uh, things that can be changed and where there can be things that uh, can be potentially promoted a little bit better. How do you envision yourself being a strong advocate for the people while also worrying about and looking at how the city is run because you have seen the internal workings of it. Yeah, a, a couple of sort of thoughts around that. The, the, the first one I would say is um, it's been a few years since I've been at the city, so guaranteed it has changed. So I certainly am not going to be walking in the door being like, I know everything. No, not at all. Uh, and then the second thing I would say on that is I think it's really important I mean, I, I know this, but uh, maybe your, your listeners or viewers don't, and, and certainly I know there's many other council candidates who don't know this, to understand the difference between governance and management. The management of everything is the role of administration. That's what, why we hired them to do those things. But what they really need is the governance. Why are we doing these things? The strategy development, not the what are we doing, but the why are we doing it and how should we be doing it? That's really uh, what we need there. So I, I plan on staying as, as firmly on the governance side as possible and then leaving it to the experts uh, um, that, the, that we've hired at the city to be, able to, to be able to articulate what we can do in order to be able to achieve those things. I'm not a city planner. I am not a reservoir engineer. I am not a, a, a transit uh, um, planner. I'm not, all of these amazing jobs that exist at the city that people go to university to learn how to do uh, and become experts in those things. What we need is a council who's really able to uh, uh, bring them along and say, here's what we kind of want to achieve. How do we actually do it? Tell me what the best what the best practices are in this field in order to be able to achieve this particular objective that we're looking for. I want to talk about retention and uh, attraction of residents here because you mentioned in your in the first few minutes of the show so far about talking to youth and actually hearing about why they're leaving. Um, Retention and attraction of residents is going to be a key priority because in my ward, and I live in the northeast of uh, the city, for sale signs are going up every day. And I talk to my neighbors and I ask them why they're leaving. Well, services aren't being provided for the tax dollars that were being charged. There's a lot of concern that, hey, yet again, uh, it's becoming an unaffordable city to live, whether it be high taxes, high house prices. So they're leaving and they're going to uh, the outskirts of Calgary, Okotoks, Chestermere, yeah. all these places. So how do you envision retaining our current uh, population, but also attracting them? Because we want to grow our city. We do have uh, vacancies in the city and we need to address that because with a better, with a better uh, residence base, we have better chances of getting better tax dollars. So how do we attract and retain our residents in our city? Yeah, that, that's really well said. And, and, and the way that I would sort of uh, 
um, phrase it and, 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 you know, the conversations I have, like I said, I work at the University of Calgary. I mean, I'm surrounded by students every single day. Uh, with, not right now. <laughs> I'm working <laughs> in my house as just, just like everybody else right now, really looking forward to getting back to campus uh, um, at some point in the near future. Um, what, what we're really hearing in, term, in terms of there's a, a couple of things. The, the, the first one is uh, it's not so much that op opportunities don't exist in Calgary so much as it is that op it doesn't feel like opportunities exist in Calgary. And that has a lot to do with the political atmosphere going on in the city and province right now. Every time council has an argument over some dumb little thing, uh, the students, the youth in our city are hearing that loud and clear and going, we don't know what we're doing. This place just wants to argue over dumb little things. Uh, they, he they hear that, they see the way that, that their leaders are behaving and, and something twigs in the back of their brain and say, maybe it's better somewhere else. Is it better somewhere else? That almost at that point doesn't even matter. It's just that little bit that's in there. Maybe it's somewhere else. You've planted the seed by uh, um, uh, by being combative or or arguing over uh, over things uh, in in minute detail. The second thing I'd say in terms of for the ones who who would love to stay here, um, there are real barriers that exist within within Calgary. And the number one that I hear about the most from folks is actually around transit. So uh, youth don't necessarily want, uh, especially in you know, their, their university and early uh, uh, career years, don't necessarily want to have to buy a house because they're still seeing you know, what city am I going to live in? I wanna keep my options open. Uh, and they definitely don't wanna have to buy a car. Um, those are the kinds of things that I would say that in other cities, there's more of those kinds of options available. Whereas the city that we built in Calgary is one that is quite far flung. Is one that uh, um, if you want to make uh, uh, if you want to take transit from one place to another, you could you could need multiple transfers. Um, all of those kinds of things that at the time the decisions were made, they made a ton of sense. Why we made those decisions to be able to build that neighborhood and 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 send a a bus line to it. But when you take a look at it from the from the you know the the 2021 uh, uh, youth perspective, that's another barrier that I have to go further aflung in order to be able to get something that matches kind of what I'm looking for. But then I have to make this trip, and that trip is just too much. And oh my god, why don't I just move to Toronto or Vancouver where it's a lot more dense, and I can just get where I need to get where I need to get to? And going back to our conversation we were having earlier, Chris, I mean. It, those competitive, competitive advantages to other places in North America really matter. Those are the kinds of things that we really need our council paying attention to about how can we actually build those things so that they work better for students, for single parents, uh, um, for kids. How do we actually build these things so that it's a lot more attractive for people to be able to, uh, to, be able to live here? and you remove that barrier from it. That's not an easy solution. I wanna be really clear. That's not the kind of thing that you're gonna fix overnight. It's not the kind of thing you're gonna fix in four years. That's the kind of thing that you need to have a clear objective for what you're trying to achieve and then take micro steps every single opportunity that you have in order to be able to improve those things. At that point, I think you're really gonna to start to see more people look at Calgary and say, Calgary's got something special. This is a really interesting place because right now I think a lot of people are looking at and going, Calgary, yeah, I've heard good things, but, and then whatever the but is. And so what I would say is that we need to start getting rid of the rest of that sentence or making it a lot more difficult for anybody to add anything after that. Um, you were, as we're on the topic of transit, let's talk about the elephant into the room. The uh, the good old fat, the good old green line, which uh, the federal government, the provincial government, and the city have all finally agreed that come this fall, we're going to have shovels in the ground. I think everyone is still up in the air about if that's actually going to happen or not, but we have politicians making a promise that it's going to be in the ground. As you said at the beginning, uh, it is stopping at 16th Ave. Um, the people of Ward 4, as you say, transportation, transit is a big issue for them. What are you hearing about the Green Line and how do we make sure that this project goes forward, but also continues to go forward past 16th Ave as well? 
Yeah, I, so again, uh, going back to what we said before, the green line is, is an issue in, in, in some of the neighborhoods in Calgary, so, or in, in Ward 4, pardon me. So Highland Park, uh, uh, Thorncliffe, Greenview, uh, uh, Beddington, Huntington, because uh, we want to get it all the way up there into the north. We know from the ridership from the 301 that, that there is a massive number of users of, that, of Center Street every single day that would love to be able to uh, simplify their life and, and to be able to take a, be able to take a train. Uh, I don't want to argue about north versus south. I mean, in a perfect world, you build you build the whole thing like that. That would be ideal. Um, but I do think that there's a reason that uh, the line is going to the southeast first and 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 not up into Ward Four uh, um, first. And and that really has to do with the tip of the hat to Shane Keating. Uh, the guy's been a champion for for the Green Line since day one. Uh, it really is amazing that, I mean, it's, a, it's almost a legacy project for him at this point in the fact that uh, he, he really, uh, he deserves a lot of kudos for, for, for advocating for his constituents and, and getting, the, getting the green line as far south as it's going into the southeast. Um, there's a reason why we don't have that in the north. We, we did not have the same uh, level of advocacy from our Ward 4 councillor over the past several years. There's a reason it's stopping at 16th Ave. Um, in, in my mind, uh, the most important aspect of this is, is that we've got to make sure that it gets over the river. If it doesn't get over the river in this build, uh, I don't know when it'll ever go north through Ward 4. Um, we got to build the expensive part first. That is all included in, in this uh, uh, first phase, which is great. Um, but I would, I would add to that, though, too, that... Um, just because I'm excited that we're finally building this thing does not mean that we get to take our foot off the gas. Like we are going to have to pay attention every single day to how the costs are going on this. This, as I said, is the biggest and most, I think it's the most expensive project that the municipality has ever done. It has so much risk to go over budget as a result of that. So we're definitely going to have to pay a lot of attention. Uh, and I'm hopeful that my project management background, uh, I, I have my PMP. I, I don't think anyone else around the council table, table in the past decade or two has, has had that. So uh, hopefully that helps and, and, and I can have some uh, intelligent conversations with the, uh, with the project management of that line to be able to figure out exactly how, how on budget are we? What are the risks? How are we managing those risks? I think we have a great uh, Green Line board in place. So I, I have a lot of faith uh, uh, that this is all going to go quite well. Uh, but council is not going to be able to uh, to to turn away. They're going to need to pay a lot of attention. So I would definitely recommend for anyone voting in this election, make sure you you're picking somebody around the council table who has an eye for the details, because this is going to be one that's going to need a lot of uh, a, a lot of conversation and thought and uh, and uh, paying attention to the details to make sure that this budget is done on time and on budget. I'm conscious of time here. I'm just making sure that uh, I don't run over the hour mark because I know you are uh, uh, still canvassing, uh, still campaigning, and I don't want to take up more than time than needed. I want to turn right now because I, I could probably sit here and talk about two hours about policy with you because I find it so interesting and I love talking policy. But I want to talk about you as the councillor now. October 19th, you are, you are the councillor designate for Ward 4 you will have to represent everyone of Ward 4. How do you envision working with people who may not agree completely with your uh, uh, stances on issues? And how will you work with people who come to you and say, I need this addressed, but you don't think it's a priority because, hey, there's bigger ish, big fish to fry and that's just a small potato compared to the bigger grand scheme of everything. Yeah, I, I'll answer the second part first. Uh, there is no small fish. Like, it, it is about individual people. So if you have a pothole in front of your house, that is your world. That That is the biggest thing. So it may not be in front of my house and I'm looking at other things, but that's got to get addressed. And we're, we're fortunate that we have great city staff who can address that. And if you're not getting uh, uh, not getting redressed through the, through those systems, Absolutely, we'll build it within the within our council office to make sure that all of those things that are big issues to individuals that they get that they get addressed. I think just about every councillor probably say something to that effect. 
The, se the second part of it is uh, how, how do you work together with people who you may not, you may not agree with? Um, and I would say, I'm rather fortunate that I, I have a reputation as someone who can work with just about anyone. Um, in my day job, again, like I said, I do community engagement, which is all about partnership development. You have two different partners who may have different visions for how it is that they want to get something, but the job is really about finding a common thread. What is the thing that, that, that uh, what's the objective for both of you, or what's your ultimate goal for both of you, and how can we build a thread between those things so that we can actually do something that'll help both partners? That's something I have a ton of experience with and have been doing, have been doing my whole career. It's something that I don't see a lot of going on in politics, but certainly at city council uh, as it currently stands. Uh, I mean, if we want to say collaborative and innovative are sort of the two big skill sets that you're going to need, those are not skills that necessarily being ward for incumbent bring, is known for, uh, um, uh, I'll say. Um, so from that point of view, collaborating, yeah, it's, it's, it's what I do. And I can definitely, I have, I have friends who are hardcore right wing, hardcore left wing, whatever you want to say. I can, be, I can work with just about anybody to be able to find that common thread about why it is that you want that thing and how it is that we can tie those together. So from that point of view, I don't have too much of a concern uh, who the other counselors are at this point. I don't have too much of a concern about who the mayor is going to be. I'm confident I'll be able to work with all of them regardless. I, I want to follow up on some of these because uh, you uh, you probably know this better than any of the people I've spoke to, but you were there to represent the people of Ward 4 once elected. But also, as a city councillor, you have to worry about, well, you already know where the, the question's going, oh, yeah. you have to worry <laughs> about the larger picture, the larger picture, the larger picture, the larger picture. Sometimes Ward 4 will have to go without because in the grand scheme of things, we have to look at the larger picture. How do you advocate for your ward while still looking at, while still having the eye on the grand scheme of things and ensuring that all of Calgary moves forward and not just Ward 4? Uh, I, I, like your, I like your question there from the point of view of like, how do we make sure that Ward 4 doesn't go without while the rest of the city, I, I, I would argue that Ward 4 has been going without for a very long time. Uh, if you take a look at where most of the investments in the city are being made, they haven't been being made in Ward 4. So from that point of view, I, I would like to see a little bit more investment going into Ward 4, but I definitely don't think that uh, uh, we, we have sort of that dichotomy that we're going to like swing the pendulum, you know, really far. Uh, we, we've already been doing that mainly through, you know, a lack of advocacy kind of thing. I'd love to see us have a little bit more advocacy for some of the improvements that we'd like to, that the neighbors would like to see in, in, in Ward 4. Uh, but I don't anticipate that the dollar figures are going to be so huge for the things that they're looking for that it's somehow going to knock some other big priority elsewhere in the city uh, off the map. So what are some of those priorities? Because while it's great to say priorities, what are some of the things that have been uh, miss, missed over the last few years and need to be addressed? Because infrastructure ages and things are going to start crumbling, potholes are going to get worse, sidewalks are going to get worse. What are the issues that people need to be addressed like day one if elected? Yeah, all of those things for sure. Uh, and I'll, I'll go a little bit deeper. Uh, water management is, is another really good one uh, that there's, uh, the, the majority of the southern part of the ward was, was actually built over top of a creek to begin with. And so as a result, uh, some of that infrastructure from when it was originally built, as you say, is, is starting to crumble. So how can we think about the opportunities that that provides for us? Is there an opportunity to, to open up some more space there uh, um, to be able to handle uh, more flood, uh, 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 I mean, we are a runoff of, for all of Nose Hill Park goes straight into uh, what what we sort of affectionately refer to as Confederation Creek. Um, doesn't have an official name. Do you know that? Doesn't actually have an official name, but we just, <laughs> most people just started calling it Confederation Creek because it's in Confederation Park. But it does run all the way along through, uh, um, through Collingwood, Charleswood, and Brentwood as well. Uh, it just happens to be sort of buried, but you can kind of look on a map and see where the, where the park spaces are to kind of give you an idea where, where that is. Um, 
so that that's one I would say, especially on the sustainable side of things, we definitely need to take a look at our water management to, to make sure that that's working well. Uh, and then uh, transport, uh, transportation, as we were saying before, multimodal transportation, not just transit, but how do we actually manage to do, uh, do it so that uh, if you want to take an Uber or a taxi or a bike, um, that you have an opportunity to be able to do those, those things safely and efficiently. Uh, and certainly, uh, uh, even if you're, you want to drive, whether it's downtown or across the city, you have an ability to do that in a, in a safe way as well. Um, I, I, I want you to put yourself on October 19th. You are, like I said, you're the newly elected councillor for Ward 4. What is priority number one in your eyes? Uh, number one for me is, uh, I'll, I'll put on that diversity and inclusion, and I'll include equity in their lens, and say the number one thing for me is really around engaging the neighborhoods. How do we be able to have conversations so that, and I, I don't know if you're, you're like me, Chris, but it feels, and often, oftentimes it feels like the only real thing that you hear from the city is at tax time. Here's the value you get for your tax dollars. Now give us your money. That starts on October the 19th. The value for tax dollars conversation has to start right there and then. Here's what we're doing. Here's the kind of return on investment we're getting. Having those conversations with people in an ongoing way and making it easier for them to have those conversations. Because right now, uh, it's it sometimes isn't the easiest to like go down to city hall and wait for 12 hours for your development permit conversation to come up. There's got to be better ways for that. And I want to start exploring those kinds of opportunities with the neighbors and then with the city. As a project manager, you have had to, in your career, put metrics on successes of projects. Um, a first year term, a first year into your term, what would be the metric of success for you? That's a good question. I haven't haven't thought a huge amount about that one. You're it, you're stumping me a little bit more here. No, well, no, I think all it's my just I want to make sure that if you do win in a yeah. year's time, I can say, hey, have you accomplished X, Y, it. and Z? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so, like I said, the biggest issues that I that I'm I'm the most concerned about are around that inclusion and around economic diversification. So, in my mind, we'll have to explore what those two metrics are because. I don't think they're just Ward 4 metrics. I think they are much larger council city of Calgary metrics, uh, that it's not just up to council to set what those are. It's actually about the, the community as a whole to be able to, deter to determine exactly what those measures are. Um, there's lots of great uh, uh, partners out there who are already working in those two fields. So I might also say that we should look to them to say, what do you think the metrics for these kinds of things should be so that we can make sure that we're, uh, we're moving against those things because you're the experts in those fields. Um, in order to get to October 19th, you have to be elected on October 18th. So take a few moments and talk to the people who are listening of Ward 4. Why should you be the next city councillor for Ward 4? I think we, I, I would love, I'd be honored to be your next city councilor in Ward 4 because I think that we need somebody who, uh, who is able to tackle these big problems that we've been talking about here, Chris. Um, we're gonna need someone, as I said earlier, around the table who has, uh, who has new ideas, who's open to innovation, who's open to trying new things, uh, and somebody who's able to work with other, who's able to work with other uh, council members because it's, it takes eight votes to get anything done. Um, and I think that we've been under underrepresented for the past uh, seven or eight years. Uh, there's a real opportunity here for us to turn a corner, to take control of to take control of your own destiny, uh, and make a decision uh, uh, on October 18th that allows you to to choose some change and uh, vote for results. Let's let's actually determine what are the results that you're looking for, and let's get going against those things rather than another four years of uh, arguing over the details and not actually getting anything done. Now, thank you for that. Uh, I'm assuming, as this is going to be airing in September, you are gearing up for uh, the last few weeks of this campaign, the last month of this campaign. How can people get involved? How can people learn more about you? Because this is the crucial time for all candidates. So how can people get involved and learn a little bit more about you? 
Uh, number one easiest way to to learn more about me is go to djkelly.ca. Uh, you can you can click on about, learn more about my background, see if it aligns with the values that 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 you hold. Um, I mean, I live as I said earlier. I live in Winston Heights, Mountain View. My kids went to uh, Brent. Uh, Brentwood Elementary, or, or pardon me, uh, Captain John Palliser Elementary in Brentwood. Um, we spent a lot all winter long uh, with the family in Confederation Park. Uh, we know the we know the ward. We've spent a lot of time in the in, in the ward. So if you want to know a little bit more about me and my background, uh, and some of the cool projects that I've worked on in the past, and how you think that those might actually uh, um, work um, in a in a counselor. Go take a look. And then the other bit that I would say there too is uh, you can take a look on the website there and click on priorities to see what are the things that I'm hearing from, with people, uh, hearing from people and see if they align with what it is that you're hearing as well. I do think that there is a real opportunity here for us to build, a, 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 a as, as we say in the priorities there, a city that we all can be proud of, one that includes everyone, that everyone sees themselves in, uh, that's affordable, uh, and, and that everyone can stay in long term, I think is a real opportunity there. So check out bjkelly.ca for more information. And if you really want to, uh, and, you, and you, uh, you like what you see there, you are obviously more than welcome to click on the button there to order a lawn sign, to donate, to volunteer. Uh, we got a great campaign team, but uh, we can always use uh, more signs, uh, more donations, and more volunteers. Uh, thank you so much for that. For everyone who's listening and to the viewers, uh, DJ's link to his website, uh, his Facebook page, his Twitter account, and his Instagram, because that's what candidates do now. All of, all of the social media platforms are in the show notes. I highly recommend that you reach out. And I highly recommend that everyone takes a moment and learns about all the candidates. While we're trying to do as much as we can on the show, learn about all the candidates that are in your ward, because this is an important election. It's the future of Calgary we're talking about. And like DJ has said, uh, if you need to vote for the person most aligned with your values. So DJ, I want to thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. It has been a pleasure. And like I said, I feel like we've just scratched the surface, but I appreciate you taking the time, even though we just scratched the surface to sit down and talk about these issues and yourself. Uh, my pleasure. Thank you very much for the opportunity. And if, if you ever do want to have that part two, whether we record it or not, I'm happy to dive into those issues in more detail with you or anyone else who's listening. Uh, feel free to shoot me an email, ward4 at djkelly.ca. I am happy to have this conversation with anyone.